at this stage move on in the agenda, um, you will note that we've got a series of expert opinions, um, people who are giving us their advice and their wisdom through the day, interspersed with the sessions where we are uh, debating various issues. And I'm delighted that we start with an absolutely crucial area, and that is on what happens in terms of food security. So I'm delighted to be able to introduce Mr. Gernot Legander, Chief of Climate and Disaster Risk Reduction at the World Food Programme. We've heard a great deal in recent days about how the poorest are likely to be affected the worst and the most. And we already know that that is already happening. So it is therefore extremely important that we hear the perception, the view from the World Food Programme. And I'm very pleased today to have Mr. Laganda to speak to you. So if you could address them. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear young colleagues in the second row, good morning. It's an honor and a privilege to be here to discuss the interface between climate change and hunger. And it is pertinent to start this conversation with the premise that world hunger is on the rise. Around five years ago, we saw the start of a trend reversal in hunger statistics. Global hunger was on the rise for the first time in decades, driven by the twin pressures of climate and conflict. In 2019, the progress the world had made in eradicating hunger had been rolled back by a decade. And two years later, after the economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, we see around 880 million people who are suffering from chronic or acute food insecurity. This sets us back by another decade. So we are living right now in the time where the reversal of development progress is taking place at a faster rate than any time before since the turn of the century. In this picture, climate change is a risk multiplier. Chronic hunger is a consequence of poverty, structural deficits, and inequalities in access to natural and economic resources. And climate pressures are making this situation much more dire. In a two degrees warmer world, we project that we will have 189 million people more in a chronic hunger situation than today. Acute hunger, on the other hand, is the result of external shocks that push people into life-threatening situations. When you read about hunger in the media, then you generally read about acute hunger in the wake of wars and disasters, such as the situation we see currently play out in Madagascar, in Afghanistan, in Yemen, or in South Sudan. At this moment, we count around 155 million people who suffer from acute hunger, and the trend here is rising very sharply. Climate change enters this picture through three distinct pathways. The first one, which is probably the most intuitive, is through extreme climate events, such as drought, storms, and floods. These climate shocks cause acute hunger and increase damage to the systems that produce food and that bring it to people's tables. Global warming makes these climate extremes more frequent and intense because it makes the hydrological cycle more active. We can see this quite clearly in global disaster statistics. Over the past 30 years, the number of climate-related disasters has more than doubled, and we see ever-growing humanitarian needs in the wake of these events. But this is not only the extreme climate events that have us worried. Lower level climatic variations and stresses are a second pathway through which climate change can drive hunger. Untimely rainfall, changes in seasonality, rising salinity in soils and groundwater, the bleaching of coral reefs and the migration of fish stock, pest infestations and heat stress in crops and livestock are all increasing the vulnerability of people. In such strained conditions, chronic hunger can turn into a life-threatening situation very quickly, when even smaller shocks, be it a hike in food prices or a seasonal flood, can make households dependent on external aid. 
a third pathway through which climate change features in global hunger statistics is via the detour of displacement, social tensions and conflict. Climate impacts displace people and this in turn can generate social tensions between different groups. In 2020, climate extremes have displaced 30 million people from their homes within their own borders, around three times more than conflicts. And in a warming world, this number is expected to increase. A study by the World Bank, published in the lead up to COP26, has projected that by 2050, we could have as many as 216 million people per year internally displaced by climate extremes, which is seven times more uh, than today. In terms of conflict potential, this is a veritable powder keg. So in summary, the climate crisis is driving hunger to new levels, and it does so through more frequent and extreme climate shocks, through lower level stresses that increase vulnerability in livelihoods, and through increasing risks of displacement and conflict. And when relating this to the discussions in COP26 here in Glasgow, then we should keep in mind that for many people around the world, the global crisis that we see in the climate is also a crisis people have in their own livelihoods. The climate crisis is a hunger crisis. As we speak in this beautiful setting here today, homes and shelters are being swept away by torrential rainfall, floods and landslides cut off entire regions from the outside world. People are losing their lives in relentless droughts and heat waves, and record-breaking storms are making landfall in new areas. This kind of work is nothing that can wait for emission reductions. There is a very strong argument for stronger systems which can help countries and communities around the world build resilience and prevent hunger in a changing climate. And I would now like to share three quick snapshots from WFP's programs in the field that aim to build such systems. The first example is related to nature-based protection or in the lexicon of COP26, ecosystem-based adaptation to climate change. In the practice of WFP, this approach works like this. During the lean season between planting and harvesting, when many families go hungry, we engage with communities in large-scale landscape restoration programs, which restore natural buffer zones and infrastructure as shields against new climate impacts. These solutions include the planting of green belts to counter erosion, the terracing of slopes to prevent landslides, the improvement of drainage systems in flood-prone areas, or the expansion of water storage in drought hotspots. On average, between 2015 and 2020, these programs have rehabilitated 1.5 million hectares of degraded land and forest, which is bigger than the area of Northern Ireland. These programs have also established 54,000 water ponds, wells, and communal reservoirs. In Chad, for example, working in partnership with 150,000 beneficiaries, WFP has established tree nurseries, which produce around 1 million tree seedlings a year. These trees help to reclaim degraded land, recharge the groundwater tables, capture carbon dioxide, and enable the production of nutritious food. A second solution focuses on the anticipation of climate hazards before they turn into disasters. Over the past decades, we have seen rapid progress in climate modeling and hazard forecasting. These skills now enable us to predict damaging events and act early if a climate hazard creates the risk of a new food crisis. An example here is from Bangladesh, where an extreme monsoon season in 2020 hit communities that were already strained by the economic and public health effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. In this situation, robust forecasting data was used to transfer cash to vulnerable families four days ahead of flood impacts. Almost 30,000 families received such support before the floodwaters arrived and impacted on their livelihoods. People used these funds to fortify homesteads, stock up on food and medicines, and evacuate livestock and family members to safe places. An external evaluation has shown that this forecast-based way of working has reached households up to 100 days earlier than conventional humanitarian aid. And 36% of households were less likely to go a day without eating during the flood. And the cost of WFP's emergency response was cut in half because the support was faster than the floodwaters were. 
A third solution I would like to share with you is related to climate risk insurance. WFP has been working for over eight years now to make climate insurance work for food insecure people. Last year, 2.1 million people in 13 African countries were protected with such solutions. And as we speak, 65,000 households in Malawi are receiving insurance payouts after a failed agricultural season. This would not have been possible if we had not made the purposeful decision and received support from forward-looking governments and donors to integrate climate risk insurance into our humanitarian toolkit. Every year, we work with millions of farmers to restore the degraded land and rebuild natural protection against climate hazards. In these programs, we used to transfer cash, food, and vouchers to people so they could meet their daily food needs. Over the past few years, we have also started to transfer insurance protection and coverage to people so they do not only have nature-based protection, but also financial protection. So these are three examples of solutions that we have seen to reduce the risk of hunger in a heating climate, scaling up nature-based protection with and through food insecure people, anticipatory action based on forecasts to prevent predictable climate emergencies, and scaling up financial safety nets for the most vulnerable. None of these solutions is a silver bullet all by itself, but these approaches are quite effective when they get integrated and layered in government programs to help manage different levels of risk. In conclusion, climate change is a risk multiplier for hunger. This problem does not lie somewhere in the future or at a level beyond 1.5 degrees of warming. It plays out as we speak, in the present tense, and all over the globe. We are convinced that without harnessing the protective power of ecosystems, the skills the world has in hazard forecasting and early warning, and without financial protection systems for the most vulnerable, neither governments nor the international aid system will be able to handle the hunger crisis that is in stock in an overheating world. This is a big reason why the World Food Program is here in Glasgow and why we greatly appreciate the opportunity to speak here with you today. Thank you. Hopefully this one is working. Um, though I am now told that um, all the mics on your tables should be working. That isn't um, an invitation for you all to speak simultaneously. Yes. But can I first of all thank Gernot very, very much indeed for putting into perspective what we're facing today. As he says, it's not about the future, it's about now and the future. And if I could just do a quick announcement, many of you will have noticed that the Wi-Fi is down at the moment. We have an incompatibility between the talking system, the microphones and the headphones, and the Wi-Fi. So while we're running sessions where people will speak, we're turning the Wi-Fi off. It'll be turned back on when we break for lunch. So you'll have to live without the internet for at least the next hour. I'm not sure whether that's possible. but uh, So that, that explains, if you're looking for the Wi-Fi, it will be off when we're using the push-to-talk mic system, and that explains the, the technical difficulty. But thanks for your um, patience on that. Well, I, I feel for our two children here in the, fr in the uh, second row, <laughs> very patiently sitting through these, this session. Thank you for coming along with your granddad. And I'm ever so sorry that right now the internet is down, as far as you're concerned, though I'm very pleased that nobody else can tweet, et cetera, et cetera, um, as we move on forward through this session. Um, if I could now please invite um, the uh, next speakers up um, for, the, for the next session that we're moving into, which is on advocacy. So that's Caroline, Rick, Zaid, and Fadley, please. And just picking up on what we've just heard, um, for those who may be feeling that you know, they don't need to address this yet, it, it really does bring it home to you um, exactly what is already happening. And um, it's, it's what fundamentally also underpins why it's vital that international development is addressed. Um, 
it isn't just the right thing to do, but it is actually in everybody's interests. And you think about what we've just heard about the, the level of potential displacement of people and the effect upon um, everybody of that, let alone those who are displaced. And you can see um, the potential effects and the way in which those malign actors can exploit that for populist reasons and so on, and the instability and conflict that is likely to be generated. So if we didn't already think that it's vital to address climate change, um, that, that important um, strand of it needs to be something that we need to have um, in, our, in our minds first and foremost. Well, I'm very glad to be able to move on to the advocacy session. Um, and perhaps I might just start by, as it were, introducing myself. Um, I'm um, in the House of Lords, I'm a Liberal Democrat, and I'm on the newly set up House of Lords Select Committee on the Environment and Climate Change that the Lord Speaker mentioned in his introductory remarks earlier on. And um, I'm delighted that in the Lords that we have set this committee up. Um, the way that it's organized in the British Parliament, in the House of Commons, the select committees monitor what happens in each department. In the House of Lords, um, we, we seek not to duplicate, and so therefore we're looking at it differently, and we're looking across government. And so, for example, that, newly select, that new select committee um, took evidence from all government departments as to how they were all preparing for COP, not just the departments that were directly responsible for them. So as we, as we um, look forward to the outcome of COP26 and hope that indeed, as Harriet said this morning, that the very difficult negotiations that are going on actually move, thing, moves, move things forward, it does sometimes feel now that we might, might be at a tipping point in terms of the demand that, that parliaments and governments take action. And that, if that's the case, when you see the involvement now in the financial sector, business and so on, if, if we're moving towards that, that has to be welcome. But it's parliaments um, passing laws that mean things actually happen that can make a difference and making sure that governments, which can so easily just focus on today or this week or next week or next month actually look long term because this must be addressed long term. Um, it's, it's there that action has to be taken. And I've always welcomed the parliamentary sessions that are run by the IPU that run alongside the COP meetings. I've been fortunate to be involved in several since the Paris meeting. It's our role is vital. And so that's why I am extremely pleased to be chairing this session um, on the advocacy that, that um, we have to carry forward. Um, the speakers will be in a slightly different order, partly because the person who will be speaking last um, had, uh, has arrived in um, having traveled for quite a distance. And so, so that's, that is the second speaker will actually be the last speaker. But I'd like to start by introducing Caroline Lucas. Um, Caroline is, in, is the one and only Green MP in the UK House of Commons. The, um, we've got two Green members of the House of Lords. Um, but Caroline has been extraordinary in the contribution that she has made as the single member of her party, um, both within Parliament and within United Kingdom politics. So, Caroline. Well, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. I appreciate it. And I just want to say what a pleasure and privilege it is to be able to address you this morning. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the existing climate legislation in the UK how it was groundbreaking at the time, but how I believe that there is a role for parliamentarians now to push for something that is even more ambitious than that. So you may well know that back in 2008, the UK passed the Climate Change Act, 
which was, as I say, at the time, absolutely groundbreaking in terms of, of the kind of architecture it put in place to address the climate crisis. And crucially, it was adopted with just about all party support. It put emission reduction targets into law for the first time, initially 80% by 2050, and then updated in 2019 to achieve net zero by 2050. It established a framework for this target to be achieved, requiring the government to set five yearly carbon targets and carbon budgets, crucially, those budgets to make sure that the, um, the, the, the targets were being met. And it also created the government's independent advisors, the Climate Change Committee, which have been really pivotal in setting the direction of travel to achieve net zero, to assess the government's progress on meeting that on a regular basis, and seeking to pull the government back on course when and if they drift and when they aren't going fast enough. And I think it's fair to say that the setting of the targets is the easy bit. It is the delivery of the targets where really I think parliamentarians have to have their greatest role in scrutiny. It is very easy to set a target 10 years, 20 years, 30 years away. What we need is the focus on delivery and that is what the Climate Change Committee has really been focusing on, making the point, for example, that right now the UK is not on track to meet its fifth carbon budget and that gaps still remain for the sixth carbon budget. And as Chris Stark, the chief executive of this Climate Change Committee has said, implementation and delivery is what matters now. But in terms of creating that piece of legislation, my first reflection would be that parliamentarians absolutely should push for the climate targets to be written in law, to require that legal basis for the targets with clear, timeframes, accountability mechanisms, and transparency so that measurements can be made towards that progress. And my second is just in thinking about how that piece of legislation became law would be to say that working with others, whether that's businesses or non-government organizations or indeed our constituents, we can build that broad coalition both inside and outside parliament, which gives greater legitimacy for the legislation that then appears. Interestingly, this Climate Change Act was first introduced as a private member's bill back in 2005. In other words, it was uh, 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 backbench MPs who came forward with the idea. It wasn't the government, it was backbench MPs who came forward with the first idea. And it was driven by an unprecedented campaign across civil society as well. But the case I would make this morning is that although that piece of legislation was indeed groundbreaking in 2008, that is quite a long time ago and the science has moved on. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's most recent report has warned, and I quote, unless there are immediate, rapid and large scale reductions of greenhouse gas emissions, limiting warming to close to 1.5 degrees or even two degrees will be beyond reach. In that context, I would argue for richer countries to set net zero targets for 2050 for 30 years away is a bit like saying that your house is on fire, but you're going to call the fire brigade in 30 years time. That doesn't work. We need the fire brigade now because the emergency is now. And that is why I'm very proud to be part of a group of MPs who are bringing forward a new private members bill it's called the Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill. And in a sense, it updates the existing legislation. It builds on it, but it makes it bolder. First of all, it would require the UK to reduce emissions in line with that 1.5 degree threshold. Second, it would treat both nature and climate at the same time. We know that nature and climate are two sides of the same coin. The nature emergency, and the climate emergency are absolutely connected. And so our legislation needs to be connected as well. And thirdly, it includes a representative citizens assembly to involve people in how we transition to a zero carbon society, drawing on their creativity and ingenuity. Finally, it would plug some of the gaps in the Climate Change Act, both by taking account of 
international emissions from aviation and shipping, which until recently have been deemed to be too complicated to bring into our climate change legislation because those are big questions about how you attribute responsibility. And also, and for me this is crucial, it involves accounting for the emissions associated with our consumption, even if that's consuming products that were made elsewhere. Because it's very easy for our government to say, as they frequently do, that the UK has reduced our emissions by 44% by 1990, since 1990. That sounds very positive, and it is, but a lot of that has been achieved by outsourcing our emissions to countries like China, and when China is making the products which we then import, the emissions end up on their accounts, not on ours. We think that isn't right, that's not fair. We know that consumption emissions make up 46% of the UK's total carbon footprint. So our legislation has got to catch up with that. Our legislation has to be based not just on territorial emissions, but on those consumption emissions as well. So we are organizing this, this new bill. I'm not expecting it to become law anytime very soon. The Climate Change Act took three years from being a private member's bill in 2005 to becoming law in 2008. But I'm hoping that we can build momentum behind this bill. We have so far 115 MPs who are supporting it. Many local authorities up and down the country have passed resolutions in support of it as well. If I have a few more moments, I'm not sure how I'm doing for time, but I'm doing okay. I wanted just to say a little bit about another initiative, which is around a Green New Deal. And many of you will have heard much coming from uh, the United States in particular about Green New Deal legislation. And I just wanted to say that one of the reasons that I'm also involved in an initiative to try to get momentum in our own parliament behind a Green New Deal is because all of the evidence suggests that people, citizens, want bolder and more ambitious action from governments. I've been really struck by how increasingly in our parliament, and maybe in yours too, people are relying more and more on citizens' assemblies. In other words, these cross, um, uh, real cross-section of the public who, who are asked their opinions on how we res should respond to the claim climate and nature uh, emergencies and they are genuinely really representative of the population at, as, as a whole including people for whom climate change is not a priority but again and again those citizens assemblies show that public opinion is far ahead of governments they want more ambitious action whether that is a, a frequent flyer levy for example which would mean that the cost of flying if you do one flight a year would stay much as it is now but if you are one of those frequent flyers who flies very often, then the price of those flights would go up very fast. And we know that in the UK, for example, just 15% of the people take 70% of the flights. So there is an appetite there for something bolder. And a Green New Deal bill would really tackle economic and social injustice at the same time as addressing the climate and nature crises. Because we know that if we're to keep public support for the measures to tackle climate and nature, then those measures absolutely have to be based on social justice. They have to be fair. They have to be fair domestically, but they have to be fair globally as well. And so I'm very proud that we have also just launched a global alliance for a Green New Deal, which will bring together 27 politicians from 22 nations, learning from one another, much as happens, I know, here in the uh, IPU, learning together from different legislation in different countries so we can get the best and boldest Green New Deal, which, as I say, crucially brings the social and the environmental together. And in my very last words, I just wanted to say a word about the importance too, underpinning everything that I've said, of moving to different measures of economic success. I just want to end by saying that I feel that as long as our governments measure progress solely in terms of gross domestic product, GDP, we are not going to get to the place we need to be because we're not measuring what matters. We know that GDP is a very crude measurement of whether or not people are feeling more healthy, whether nature is more healthy, whether people are better educated, whether there's less inequality in our countries. And our obsession with GDP growth means we are not measuring what matters. 
And so I think underpinning all of this, parliamentarians have a crucial role to play to be saying, let's measure what matters, let's look at a well-being economy based on a range of other indicators so that we can have a better idea about whether we really are moving in a fairer and more sustainable direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline. And I'm going to have to watch the time very carefully, actually. I can see that we are actually slipping in terms of time, but I'm very grateful to Caroline for her contribution. Uh, we're moving on now to uh, the third speaker on the list, um, and um, Mr. Zaid al Atoum, who's the chairman of the Parliamentary Energy Committee of Jordan's House of Representatives. Um, so a, a different part of the world, a, a country which has, which has um, taken in many refugees from conflict over many decades, as well as facing all the pressures of water shortages and other shortages. So I look forward to hearing your contribution. Thank you. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be upon you. The climate change effect on Jordan is enormous. Some of the root causes of this climate change, change are within our control, while others are not. Hence, Jordan is the victim and not the doer. That's the way we see it. In terms of water, Jordan's climate is changing rapidly. We are a semi-dry country climate where rainfall is around 50 millimeters in most parts of the country. Jordan is one of the poorest four countries in the world in water resources. The average share of water per person is 96 meet cubic meters per year while the average worldwide is 500. The river of Jordan is not as it was mentioned in the Bible. The Dead Sea is losing half a meter every year. As we speak, two of the main dams in Jordan were dried up. In terms of energy, Jordan consumes or imports 93% of its energy needs. Transportation in Jordan needs a lot of work and development, and this has contributed significantly to the gender gap. Urban planning uh, in governors and cities is not balanced. The capital, Amman of Jordan, holds 42% of the residents where it had in five, well, 150 years ago, the inhabitants were around 4,000 only, and now it is around five and a half million. The reason behind this mainly is political instability in the region. Jordan, Jordan's population increased dram dramatically. I remember when I was in school in the 80s, the population of Jordan was uh, two and a half million. However, now it is 11 million. This is due to political instability in the region where one out of each four persons living in Jordan is a refugee. And they come from different countries around the world, uh, around the region. They come from Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, occupied Palestine. While we are in Jordan, we are delighted to perform our humanitarian and moral obligations towards refugees, however, we, we need help. We are doing much more than what, we, what other countries uh, should be doing, and uh, we can do uh, much more. Uh, the international community must stand up when, uh, with Jordan, and uh, now, since there, are, there is political instability in a stable country, uh, then we have to share our resources with all uh, refugees in Jordan. Many countries around the world offered to help Jordan, but few have fulfilled their obligations. For example, uh, there were uh, 
obligations towards Jordan uh, for financial assistance, 40% of them were only fulfilled. This has led to more poverty and unemployment and the uh, more burden on Jordan's debt, where currently the debt is 113% of the GDP. However, nonetheless, there are opportunities. Jordan has an, a highly educated population. Uh, Jordan has uh, a political stable uh, environment and is a, uh, is a stable country. Jordan is located in the solar belt countries where the sun shines more than 300 days a year for eight hours a day. There are some success stories and Jordan has a central location we are uh, heavily uh, moving towards renewable energy, and Jordan is willing to contribute and do its share of, uh, among all countries. In terms of parliament, we have a new parliament now. One, 130 parliamentarians, 100 of them are new parliamentarians, and they are young. This parliament is eager to work. We will be preparing a separate committee, we, are, we will be proposing actually a separate committee that is related to climate change, environment and green economy, while there is a current committee that is related to, that is connected to the health. But once we come back to Jordan, we will be proposing this to the parliament. The, par the parliament will be overseeing the government action when it comes to NDCs and to assess their progress. There are many proposed projects in the NDCs that amount to $7. billion. There are many strategies for, for all sectors that needs to be amended and to be in conformity with international obligations and agreements and NDCs. Strategies be, needs to be coordinated between each other and their financing. We are eager to initiate the necessary, necessary legislation while we already have uh, the, uh, the necessary uh, foundation and legal structure uh, to tackle climate change. There should be enough budget allocated to meet our obligations and we need to work with youth and promote climate change obligation. There has to be effective accountability and transparency. We will be asking for a vision for a period that is way beyond 200, uh, 2030. We need to further encourage circular economy activities and electrification of our economy. There should be a, an economy-wide wide adaptation of NDCs. All of this has to be speedy. In terms of finance, we need finance and we need international cooperation. Our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, once said, Conserve water even if you are by a running stream. Thank you everyone for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. And uh, we will be looking forward to be part of changing our climate and our planet to the better. Thank you so much. Thank you. And if we now focus on another part of the world, um, we're now looking at Indonesia. Um, and again, um, we are all interlinked. Um, in, it's been made very clear in terms of the discussion on forestry, um, how Indonesia's role here is, has an effect globally. Um, and the government of Indonesia um, also is seeking to ensure that poverty is addressed and the country is developed. So we look forward to hearing our third speaker, Dr. Fadil Zon, MP from the Indonesian House of Representatives. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Excellencies, Honorable Member of Parliament, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Peace be upon us all. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share a brief update on parliamentary efforts to mainstreaming a green economy in Indonesia. Transitioning to green economy uh, requires capital intensive investments in renewable energy and in the public good that promote communal use. 
By default, it entails a shift from fossil fuels to renewable energy sources. This will require Parliament to exercise strong oversight and make full use of our lawmaking authority. The government of Indonesia has taken the effort to mainstream low carbon and green economy in the national development planning through the Low Carbon Development Initiative. Economically speaking, such transition will also be expected to have a positive impact on fiscal policies on fossil fuel energies, such as the coal subsidy. And as Indonesia will use more renewable energy, coal subsidy will be less and it can be redistributed for other sectors. Green economy is also said to create more employment opportunities. With the right policies in place, it could create 24 million new jobs globally by 2030. So it can enable millions more people to overcome poverty and deliver improved livelihoods. Currently, the House of Representatives of the Republic of Indonesia is in the process of enacting the new and renewable energy bill. Aside from sending the policy signal to clean energy transition, and as part of efforts to minimize regulatory risk, the NRE bill reflects the commitment of Indonesia to address climate change under the Paris Agreement. However, considering the importance of coal to our economy, there is a significant need for a political will to support this bill. I shall mention that balancing the environmental target with the cost of shifting from industry that contributes billions to our economy certainly is challenging. Another challenge is in grounding the notion of green economy into the mind of the people and securing their long-term support on the agenda. In order to gather this support, we need to maintain citizen engagement through forms of deliberative democracy and enable them to participate effectively in the discussion on various elements of green economy. So in order to engage public on this issue and on this issue in relation to the bigger framework of sustainable development goals, our committee and parliament has consistently conducting dialogue with multiple stakeholders across Indonesia including academia, university students, and local provincial governments through a program called SDGs Day. One of the recent initiatives from the Committee for Interparliamentary Cooperation of the Indonesian Parliament, in partnership with the Westminster Foundation for Democracy, is a series of projects on green economy. A white paper on the agenda for green economy in Indonesia, policy initiative, citizen assembly, and international cooperation has also been drafted and will be launched in the first week of December. So we have the policy papers uh, in cooperation with the Westminster Foundation for Democracy. The white paper is highlighting some challenges as well as, as, well as, uh, as well recommendations such as the emphasis on recalibrating the institutional structure to give it a power and embedding green economy into long-term policy objectives in order for it to support political dynamic or results of elections, as well as developing citizen assembly to create the subjects representing the diversity of population of Indonesia to inform and work closely with the policymakers. So this year, the government of Indonesia is joining the COP26 with the spirit of keeping the 1.5 degrees Celsius. Indonesia plans also plans to achieve net zero by 2060 or sooner. What the House of Representatives of the Republic of Indonesia will do, and we actually is doing it, is a big push for the government on the following. First, on setting a viable pathway to a formidable clean energy sector. This will include finalizing the presidential decree on the economic value of carbon 
and develop a carbon tax and carbon exchange technical mechanism following the newly enacted law on tax regulation harmonization. And second, on accelerating the target to achieve net zero emission and keeping up with the global aspiration of 2050. In my opinion, a decade behind international commitment is a bit too late for a country as sizable population as Indonesia. In supporting this, the House of Representatives will need to exercise stringent parliamentary oversight and re legislative scrutiny with a view of making scrutiny on climate impact assessments of all legislation as matter of routine procedure. For Indonesian Parliament, we will contribute through encouraging international collaboration, holding all nations to ambitious commitments based on the principles of equity, common but differentiated responsibilities, and respective capabilities. This will include encouraging international cooperation on research and innovation. And as closing uh, remarks, uh, Indonesia has a track record of creating opportunities out of crisis. We have been through challenges in the past and we answer, uh, we answer it with reforms that raise competitiveness, develop human capital, and achieve economic success. COVID-19 has present us with the single largest challenge to humanity. However, it also brings the opportunity to build a clean, green, healthy, and climate-friendly future. So green economy is one of the long-awaiting answers to the need of balancing the need for local ecological footprint and high growth. So I believe that supported by the right measures and concerted efforts, there is a real opportunity to emerge stronger in a more inclusive and sustainable ways in the post-pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the theme is emerging of parliaments holding governments to account for everything they do in terms of tackling climate change. Um, and um, having rearranged the program a little bit, maybe it's appropriate then that, we've, that we've, we are now talking about, in effect, parliaments working with each other. Um, so Rick Dimes, who's the president of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, and that um, uh, brings together many European parliamentarians, and it's vital that we do all work together as we are here today. So Rick. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. You know, last week a good dear friend of mine, uh, Baroness, called me from the United States saying, hey Rick, I'm, I'll be passing through Brussels next Sunday. Why don't we have lunch? And I told her, no, sorry, sorry Greta, I'll be in Glasgow at the COP26. And then she went, COP26, is that that climate thing? I said, yeah, that's that climate thing. It is the conference of the parties, you know, people that signed the big convention. And this is the 26th time that we get together, you know, to address this issue. And then Greta goes, hey Rick, is this the 26th time you get together over 30 years and it's still going the wrong way? Ouch. What does it tell us? It tells us exactly, Karen, as you say, the things that matter are the things we do. The things that matter are not only the targets that we set out, it's needed, but it is the results that count. And if I take a small expression of uh, young lady Thurenberg, I think last yesterday or something, when she told, yeah, blah, blah, blah. We had a minister some 20 years ago in Belgium and she was a minister for environment and she said then, we don't need blah, blah, we need boom, boom. Nice expression. And she was right and we are right. And Caroline, you are right. It is the results that count. And yes, it was ouch when a dear friend told me, are you out of your mind? Meeting 26 times in 30 years and the thing, climate, is still going the wrong way. Wow. It also tells me a second thing, that a lot of people still don't think that climate is an important issue. Because she went further saying, ah, Rick, don't go there. <laughs> doesn't mind, doesn't go the right direction. Let's have lunch. I said, no, sorry. 
And I told her, listen, I'm not a climate activist, I'm not a green fanatic, what have you. I'm just a simple wine farmer, just for you to know, I'm a wine farmer by profession, amongst other things. But I can tell you this, 20 years ago, we harvested at the end of September, the beginning of October. Now, we are harvesting at the beginning of September. Talk about climate change, that's a whole month, in my simple case, that the seasons have shifted. Can you imagine what this does if you expand that to all different types of activities? Dear colleagues, climate change is very real and I see it in my practice as a very simple wine farmer. We have to adapt a lot in order not to go underwater. Now coming to the main question of accountability, advocacy and all that, I speak to you as president of the um, Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe this is 47 countries in Europe, more than 600 members of parliament out of these 47 countries. It is based on the European Convention of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms. It basically creates one big legal space for more than 800 million citizens to go to court on human rights, fundamental freedoms, democracy, rule of law, to the court in Strasbourg. Now the court in Strasbourg, they can judge a government. Now coming to climate, what did we do and we had to fight for it? We addressed one simple question. Is a healthy, safe, clean, sustainable environment a basic human right? Is it a basic human right? Look at the convention, doesn't say much, but it says every citizen has the right to life, to live. And our question was, yeah, but what's life worth if you cannot enjoy it? in a safe, healthy, clean and sustainable environment, it's worth nothing. That's the reality and so we addressed that simple question and the question was unanimously yes. Now what does it mean in the context of the Council of Europe? It means that we now have a request out unanimously to the Committee of Ministers, these are the 47 governments, a request saying you have to do something about it and our request is that you introduce the right to a clean, safe, healthy and sustainable environment into the European Convention of Human Rights as a basic right. Now this doesn't say much to you maybe, but what does it mean? If we would get there, it would mean that any citizen within this legal space of 47 countries can go to court if a government doesn't do what it is supposed to do. That is an enormous paradigm shift. Because we went, at least from the assembly side, from responsibility to accountability. There is the word. This, if we get there, this means that any citizen can hold any government of the 47 member states accountable if they do not do what they are supposed to do in terms of fighting climate change. Now, this is important. Why? I mean, I've been minister long enough to know if you don't push a minister, he doesn't move, or she doesn't move. If you don't have a stick to beat the, the donkey, of course you need a carrot too, but if you don't have a stick, forget it. The minister won't move, why? Because you're in the middle of so many arbitrage and so many things together, and you have to fight in the council of minister. And so it basically means that as long as you keep environment on the level of policy, it basically is weight against other policies. So you never get there. And then you have jobs against climate. Guess who wins? Not difficult. This is why at the Council of Europe, at the Assembly, we said no. We have to elevate the environmental issue from policy to principle. And that is what we are trying to do. And I'm very pleased to say, uh, Baroness and colleagues, that normally the Committee of Ministers takes like six months to a year, sometimes to say nothing. But now within two weeks, they said, yeah, let's go for it. And said to put it in the committee, the CDDH, again, a difficult thing, is the committee of experts who is going to see in which way is it possible to create a legal instrument, be it to introduce it in the European Convention of Human Rights, be it a binding convention, to yes, hold governments accountable in terms of doing something, not talking about it, but doing something in reality about the environment issue.
we could call it a bit a, a top-down approach. But it is important if we get there. That won't be tomorrow. But still, there's one simple element that you need to take into account. The moment that we in the assembly adopted in a unanimous way all these recommendations, that's how they're called, the big reports, we put the question to the chair of the Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. We said, Robert, what does it mean for you? Because they're getting environmental cases. It's not in the convention, but through Article 2, Right to Life, they get now more and more cases on environment. And his answer, dear colleagues, and this is quite amazing, publicly, we got the answer of the judge responsible for environment in the Court of Human Rights. He publicly said, in an event we organized, all these reports and the fact that it has been unanimously adopted in the Assembly, it means that this is the unanimous will of the members of parliament of 47 countries, opposition majority, all together. So any judgment that we will render in the future will take this into account 100%. It's not law, it's soft law. So that's where we are. Not far enough, but at least that's where we are. Now, colleagues, the governments, they start to panic. Because now they say, whoa, this soft law might become a bit of a problem, you know? Because it's unanimous. And this is, let's call it tactics. We are amongst members of parliaments. This is a closed meeting. Of course, it's public, but it's semi-public. But now you will have governments saying, whoa, we have to limit this thing. And this is the driver that we use to push now the committee of ministers to say, okay, you want to be on the safe side? Give us a convention and put it in the convention itself. That is where we are. It's not tomorrow. Now, coming to accountability again, this is the accountability that if it works, it will give basically the power to the people, between brackets, to go to court. On the other side, when you talk about bottom-up, this is where you come in. And this morning when I, I was traveling with my good friend Andries Griffois, he told me the national level is basically the bottom-up one. You in this room, members of parliament, you can hold your governments accountable because, I mean, you vote the laws. You can even put a government out of business if you wish to do so, if they, for example, don't do what they should do on environmental issues. And so this is the bottom-up and top-down approach that I suggest to you. Of course, we only can speak on behalf of these 47 member states, Baroness, unfortunately, but maybe it might be an example to others of you to take this dual approach. And two, on the bottom upside, to really hit out, hit, I mean, get out there in your parliaments and hold your governments accountable. With all due respect, when my friend Greta told me, come on, 26 times you get together, still going the wrong way, maybe it is, don't get upset now, because we members of parliament didn't do enough. Could it be? With all due respect, I think it's true. So we should step up, members of parliament, and we should hit on the governments in a nice way at the beginning, not because we are green activists, not because we are climate whatever. One of the problems, by the way, we do have is that the climate issue is a bit situated in a certain part of the political spectrum. We have to get it out there. It's a bit leftish, you know? It's not left, not right, not middle. It's for everyone. So maybe we should step up our action as members of parliament and do something about it and hold the governments accountable. It's not that difficult, you know. You just put a very nasty question to a minister and there you go. And you can have a nasty question in a nice way, Baroness. I can tell you that. So this is the message that I would like to give to you today. One last remark. If there is one single issue, colleagues, that we have the opportunity to reconnect to the young people who hate our guts at the moment. Saying in a very straightforward way, but it's true. If there's any single issue we can reconnect with all these young people, get them on board, it is the environmental question. So if we do enough, fast enough, not too little too late, too much too fast, if you wish, we might be able to reconnect to these young people and not lose them go in whatever political direction that will hurt democracy itself. Last reflection, someone told me, but Rick, this was not great, that was another friend, don't worry, nature will restore itself. 
I think historically speaking that is accurate. But the main question, you know, which it is? Yes, nature will, will restore itself, but will it restore itself with or without us? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, having heard from our four presenters, um, I've now got a large number of people who wish to contribute, and that's fantastic. So what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to take, I'm going to take the first half dozen um, brief questions or contributions. Your mics hopefully should work on the table. Then I'll ask for uh, brief responses from the table. And then I hope to move on to the next half dozen with further responses. But we'll see how we go. Um, the, in this first group, I'll be taking Argentina, Serbia, Portugal, Ireland, Algeria, and Malta. So first of all, to um, Gladys Gonzalez, Argentina. Buenos días, gracias. No es una pregunta, entendí que podíamos tomar la palabra. No sé cuánto tiempo tenemos para expresarnos. Repito. Ok, ok, bueno. Eh, gracias otra vez. Eh, en Roma, en la PRECOP, hicimos hincapié desde Argentina en la necesidad de enfrentar este proceso respetando contundentemente el, conce el concepto de responsabilidades comunes, pero diferenciadas, de perseguir una transición verdaderamente justa y de hacerlo sin dejar a nadie afuera. Quería contarles en este bloque que refería a la acción climática, a lo que estábamos haciendo, pero la verdad es que un minuto es demasiado poco. Entendía que podía expresarme un poco más de tiempo. La verdad que en Argentina nosotros hemos construido el andamiaje institucional para poder planificar nuestra política climática de largo plazo. Tenemos un gabinete de cambio climático, una ley de presupuestos mínimos de mitigación y adaptación al cambio climático. Eh, un gabinete que por supuesto es transversal a todas las áreas de gobierno. Nosotros adherimos al Acuerdo de Escazú, al Acuerdo de País, presentamos nuestra contribución nacional, incrementamos nuestra ambición y la verdad que llevamos todo este andamiaje a la acción empezando nuestra transición energética. En el 2015 pasamos del 2% de la energía, de energía renovable a actualmente el 12%, y aún 24, picos de 24 en transición energética. Y también hemos creado áreas protegidas, seis parques nacionales, el sistema de áreas protegidas marinas. La verdad podría enumerarles mucho de lo que estamos haciendo, pero quería decirles, para volver a enfatizar, en cada vez que nuestro país pide ayuda, no pide ayuda para empezar un proceso, sino para acelerar un proceso que ya empezamos. Y este proceso tiene que ser sí o sí un proceso de transición justa, sin dejar a nadie afuera, ni adentro de nuestros países, ni en el concierto de las naciones. Es muy importante lo que se dijo hoy, que para que seamos cada día más, ese proceso tiene que ser justo e inclusivo. La mirada de los países desarrollados tiene que ser justa. Claramente todos también sabemos que si bien nuestro país va a hacer el esfuerzo y está haciendo el esfuerzo y tiene la convicción de llevar adelante un desarrollo sostenible, el mayor poder está en las naciones en las naciones desarrolladas. Por lo tanto, sería ejemplificador y de gran impulso ver a las naciones desarrolladas acelerar el cambio hacia el nuevo paradigma y hacerlo con esta mirada justa que les decía. Así que creamos una épica colectiva, como decía Debbie Attenborough en, hace poquitos días en la COP, lo que hicimos separados, que fue des desestabilizar el mundo, podemos hacer juntos salvándolo.
Thank, thank you very much indeed. Can I now move on to Serbia? And um, Mr. Dacic, if I've got the name right. segments of society need to be involved. I think it is uh, very important that the parliaments are actively involved in this fight and uh, that is why I want to thank uh, the IPU and the British delegation to the IPU who organized this gathering and uh, enabled us on behalf of our parliaments to give our contribution. There are no political and economic differences and interests that could be an excuse for any of us to come out of the common front on the fight to preserve the climate. Unfortunately, at the, at the summit here in Glasgow, we saw that there are such excuses and that some other reasons are put as more important that the, the fate of our planet. These reasons do not exist and um, until we have full unity around these goals, the problem will exist and will be bigger. The Republic of Serbia is active in this fight and participates in all global initiatives to reduce harmful gas emissions. We understand that as an obligation towards us and our future generations, but also as an obligation towards others. Obligations to reduce harmful gas emissions are built into our laws and they are implemented. Serbia is a small country and its share in the global threat to the climate is not large, but it still exists. Our economy has been on an upward trajectory for a long time, our energy needs are increasing and thus the risk of potential pollutions is growing. In that sense, Serbia has been stimulating the energy transition and increasing the capacities for the production of energy from renewable so sources through various measures for years. As we have committed... Um, could I, we could have I? Could Richard? I ask you to wind up? Uh, we need to have um, brief interventions or questions, please. Um, if you've got statements, it would be really, okay. really helpful if they could um, be passed through to the IPU so that we've got copies and we can distribute them. We hope to do so. Um, so if you wouldn't mind um, concluding, and then we can try to move on to others. And there will be other opportunities for people to... Um, be talking with each other and contributing in other sessions. Okay. Uh, that, is way, that is why I want to call here on behalf of the Republic of Serbia once again for global solidarity in this aspect, in technological, financial and any other support that will lead, that will lead to the achievement of common goals. If that is not the case, I am not optimistic that we will be able to effectively deal with the biggest problem of our generation, and that is the destruction of the climate and accelerated change that we will not be able to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you for concluding your remarks. Um, moving on to Portugal now, um, Hortense Martins. And if people could be brief, and as I say, if you've got co uh, longer contributions, please pass them through to the IPU um, secretariat down here in the corner. Dear Portugal. colleagues, the time has come to act. Allow me to share what we are doing. Portugal has fulfilled its obligations under the Paris Agreement, having submitted 
is strategy, the roadmap to carbon neutrality 2050 to the United Nations well ahead of the deadline in 2019. Portugal was a pioneer in assuming carbon neutrality at the Marrakesh Cup in 2016. Our country has been phasing out incentives for fossil fuels and this was a decisive factor in the end of coal-fired electricity production in Portugal. But it's necessary to ensure that the carbon has a price. The price should reflect the environmental impacts associated with its emission. So while at the same time behind sufficiently relevant to support innovation and technological change necessary for decarbonization. We must ensure both public development at and development finance institutions are consistent with this course of action. This last Friday, the Portuguese Parliament approved the framework law on climate, which condenses guidelines for the Portuguese climate policy and anticipates the country's carbon neutrality. It is established that Portugal should reduce emissions. The targets set should be reviewed in order to increase the degree of ambition considering the results obtained in the, the decarbonization and the new scientific and technology knowledge. It's an ambitious law that recognizes a climate emergency situation. It's intended to have a rapid and socially balanced transitions towards a sustainable economy and carbon neutrality, climate justice, and ensures the protection of the most vulnerable communities and the sustainable and irreversible path to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Let's act how we can all do it together. Thank you. Thank, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you very much. Um, the next one I have on the list um, is under Ireland, but I can't find the name on the list of participants, um, so I don't know if I've got the wrong country down here. Um, Mr. Finson? Madam Chair, uh, my name is Brian Litton. I'm uh, the, delegate, the head of delegation from Ireland, um, and I'm chair of our climate committee uh, in our parliament. Uh, I have a, a question for the Honourable Member uh, of the UK Parliament, Ms. Lucas. Um, and just to note that Ireland has recently passed a very ambitious climate act and uh, it aims to reduce our emissions by 51% uh, based on 2018 levels uh, and indeed net zero by 2050. Uh, and with respect to other countries and their ambitions, uh, the glide path that Ireland is going to take is one of the steepest, if not the steepest, in the world. But our Climate Act is very much based on the UK Act, which was brought in more than a decade ago, I think. Uh, and I'm interested to hear from uh, Ms. Lucas uh, what the learnings from the UK uh, experience have been. I note that the UK is up to its fifth carbon budget. We've just announced our uh, first three carbon budgets, we're entering into our first period now uh, immediately, uh, and those carbon budgets are going to take us through to 2035. We are, we've announced a climate action plan, a very ambitious climate action plan. Uh, there's uh, a lot of uncertainty about whether we can actually achieve uh, the, the cuts that we want to do, and the, the, there's a lot to learn still. Uh, and I'm just very keen to learn from Ms. Lucas well, what you can tell us, and I think um, Probably our countries are, are a bit ahead of the curve in terms of enacting ambitious climate legislation. And if delegates can hear from you on that, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for engaging with the panel on, on that particular question. I'm not going to be able to get um, beyond the little group that I mentioned because, um, because statements are taking longer. So if you could please be brief so that we can engage as much as possible, that would be absolutely fantastic. Uh, my, the next person I'm calling upon, briefly please, is from Algeria, uh, Mr. Sabuta. Shukran. 
زميلة الزملاء كنت أود أن أقدم لكم الاستراتيجية الواسعة للجزائر في مجال مواجهة. Excuse me. Would you mind if you've got a copy of the extended strategy of Algeria, passing it through to the IPU so that we can circulate it? Um, I think that I think that would be. But if you've got particular questions that arise from it that you want to flag to the panel, that would be very helpful. For two, two, two minutes. Uh, not, we haven't got two minutes, I'm afraid. Um, so if you wouldn't mind putting whatever questions you've got to the panel. It's okay. Okay, thank you very much indeed. We very much appreciate receiving a copy of your strategy. Um, could I now move on to Malta, uh, Mr. Angelo Ferrugia. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, having, heard, having heard the panelists, first of all, I would like to underline the fact that it was Malta in 1988, precisely on the night of September, that Malta came out with the idea and the initiative of climate change, and it asked the Secretary General at the time, the United Nations, to put it on in the agenda of the 40th session. At the time, all the world was, uh, was laughing at Malta. But now we know that climate change is very serious. And I'm speaking very clearly, because as Speaker of the House in Parliament, I, I always monitor clearly the, the initiative of the parliamentarians to the effect that last year, 2020, Malta updated the Climate Change Act, which is a clearly example that we have to lead by example if we are talking about climate change. We also embarked in an ambitious 30-year journey towards decarbonization which involves low-carbon development strategy. We also involve the public consultation, and I'm saying this for the panelists to see how we have to uh, monitor properly, not only Parliament, but engage the public in the long-term renovation strategy and low-carbon development strategy. Malta is one of the first countries to declare the aim to change climate neutrality by 2050, and Malta is the lowest emitter per capita in the EU. So I'm saying this for the, for the uh, consideration of all parliamentarians to speak now not on facts, but to speak about actions of each and one of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, if I can now come back to the panel for um, brief re reflections on what we've heard. Um, and can I again remind people, if they've got statements as to where they're, what they're doing within their parliaments, please put that through to the, um, to the desk in the front of the IPU. Um, so can I take them take in the same order in which people spoke? So Caroline first. By, um, better. Uh, by the theme of global solidarity that came out certainly from Argentina, Serbia, and Portugal in particular, and I would really underline the importance of that. So that was the first kind of reflection on what I've heard. There was a specific question for me from, from Ireland, and um, congratulations on, on all that you're doing. That sounds incredibly exciting. I guess the learnings from the UK Climate Change Act would be about the vital nature of the Committee on Climate Change. I am not sure if you have a similar committee that is reporting, but the more public those reports can be, um, and the more transparent, then I think it really helps to galvanize public pressure as well. In our situation, the chair of the Climate Change Committee is from the same party as the government. And in a sense, that's very helpful because it takes away any sense that this is a party political issue. Um, and when he speaks out, this is Lord Deben, John Gummer, as was, when he speaks out on behalf of the Climate Change Committee, people really listen because they know that his statements are coming from an independent source, not from some kind of party political position. So I think that the issue of, of that committee and public reporting is crucial. The focus on delivery is crucial, and that is where our debate now is in the UK, not so much on targets very much on short-term delivery. Um, and finally, I would say, and this is where the bill that I was referring to comes in, I do think it's important 
um, now to move to imported emissions in those calculations, not just the territorial emissions. Thank you. Thanks very much. Zaid. Said, would you have you got any comments on um, what you've heard? No. Fadil, any comments on what you've heard? Well, I just would like to add and emphasize. I think, uh, member of parliament, of course, we have very great concerns about the climate change and the target that uh, we need to with. Uh, the most important thing I think uh, we have to understand that to approach this there is no one size fits all. And another thing I think uh, for developing countries like Indonesia what um, we need is like getting institution right. That is the most important thing. And getting uh, intervention right. So getting institution right and getting intervention right is maybe the most important thing and as part parliamentarians, we have to oversight this and we have to put the government accountable uh, for this one. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Rick. Bueno, um, como decía la, la señora de Argentina, uh, como miembros de parlamentos nacionales tenemos que trabajar juntos globalmente, digamos, al, al nivel planetario. And so this brought me to an idea, and I see the Secretary General of IPU. I mean, you know me in the meantime. I mean, you, you put me in a meeting, I'll start being creative. And since this uh, is a session of advocacy, um, and I do like to have meetings with results, but this is, okay. <laughs> so in one of the recommendations, Mr. Secretary General, your colleague, that we put to the Committee of Ministers, we advocated to set up some kind of a environmental parliamentary network now, this concerns only the 47 countries of the Council of Europe, but I would be glad to share that with, uh, with you and with the President, my good friend, uh, whether this would be an option to look into through IPU. Now, what would it mean? Just one example. It might mean that, for example, our advocates, our ambassadors in that network could put the same question to their governments at the same day and requiring requesting an answer and putting accountability on the table. It's just an idea, but just imagine that as a result of, of this meeting, the first of, I don't know which month, in all parliaments of the whole world, our ambassador would say, hey, it's time to tell us what you did and hold the government accountable. I think that might have an effect. Maybe not, it might. It's a bit creative, Baroness, I admit, but this is what sits in one of our recommendations. We will do that, but I would gladly, President, share that with you and do it together and have this kind of, uh, I don't know, environmental accountability day. And I can bet you that the governments there will be shivering the day before. I mean, they will be sweating in their beds. That's what we need. <laughs> right. On which point? <laughs> um, one of the things that's been flagged, actually, in previous IPU meetings is that the Grantham Institute, and Lord Stern is associated with it, um, has um, done some incredibly useful analyses of what um, what's has, has been done in each country's parliaments. So where, where you've got environmental laws, climate change laws, and so on, um, and seeing... Um, seeing that for your country um, is very useful, I think, for parliamentarians holding your governments to account and seeing how you compare with other countries and what you can, um, what you might be able to borrow in the sense, in, in the way that the Irish delegate mentioned in terms of the UK or whatever, or what we can learn from you. Um, all of that, I think, is very useful. Um, I am not at all surprised with a room full of parliamentarians that there is some frustration that you haven't had as much opportunity to talk uh, and tell us what you're doing as you would wish. I hope that you will be able to share some of that over lunch and um, later and also in the other sessions and continued involvement with us. I think that's absolutely vital. Um, but knowing that we are short of time, I want to move on at this stage, um, please, to our next uh, speaker, 
um, and that is, is Chris Law from the UK, from the Commons. Um, another um, opinion piece, um, which I think is, is very important in terms of um, um, interjecting in, in, into our program. Um, there's a lot of thank, thank, um, but thank you to all of my speakers, all of the panel. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> thank you. And thank you to all of you. And sorry I couldn't call many of you. And thanks for your patience. Um, but moving in on to the next part of the agenda, otherwise we will be here all week. Um, can I introduce Chris? Um, he's on the Select Committee on International Development. He's the uh, Scottish National Party member for Dundee West and has been since 2015. And he is the SNP's uh, spokesperson for international development and climate change, which are obviously closely connected. And um, we work very much across parties and in both houses of parliament together on all of these issues. So it's a, de a delight to introduce Chris. Uh, thank you, Chair. Excellencies, ladies, gentlemen, and fellow parliamentarians. Um, this is my third time I've attended COP. And I have to say, it's a heartwarming privilege. And I'm totally grateful for each and every one of you to be here so I can able to speak in my home nation to you. Um, for the last five, nearly five years, I've been both the Scottish National Party spokesperson for international development, but also for climate justice. And I've also had the privilege to serve as a member of the cross-party select committee on international development within the House of Commons. Now, during that time, it's been very clearly my mission to put the urgent need to address the climate emergency, how we approach international development, and of course, aid spending. Within a year of joining the committee, an inquiry into UK aid in combating climate change was initiated, and my colleagues and I began to take evidence. We asked a straight and very simple question. What will the consequences be if the international development community failed to rise to the, the issues of climate change. We listened to NGOs, academics, parliamentarians like we are here, and governments, and were answered with a depicted, uh, depicted a nightmarish future. Drought, flooding, displacement, hunger, disease, and endless migration, not to mention countless and preventable loss of life and huge loss of biodiversity became clear that sustainable development goals will be rendered unachievable and existing development gains will be reversed. And significantly, without immediate action, climate change will exacerbate an already unequal world with the least developed countries and the most vulnerable people hit first and hit the hardest. The World Health Organization projects that there'll be a quarter of a million additional deaths annually from 2030 to 2050. Let's just think about that for a second. That means in excess of 5 million deaths by 2050. And to give you an idea that what that means in scale, that's the same as the population of this country of Scotland that you're hearing today. Now, we've all seen our governments have taken extraordinary measures and found significant sums of money to stop preventable death and suffering from COVID-19. There is no time to delay in similarly addressing the climate emergency. This will and can only be achieved if higher income countries provide the financial support to low and middle income countries to address their needs for mitigation, adaptation, and let's not forget, equally importantly, loss and damage. So it is with deep regret that the target of $100 billion per year in climate finance for developing countries was not met in 2020 and will not be met for a further two years. It is the responsibility of each and every one of us to ensure that our governments do not allow this to fall by the wayside. And I say this because in connection to this, every year currently, we subsidize fossil fuel investments around the world to the tune of $430 billion. That needs to stop. Furthermore, adaptation can no longer play second fiddle to mitigation in terms of international climate finance. Only 25% of climate finance has been invested in adaptation globally in recent years. 
there must be greater balance between adaptation and mitigation if those most vulnerable are to be properly equipped to deal with climate change. In order to truly combat this great challenge, reduce poverty and achieve the sustainable development goals, our aid and climate spending must work hand in hand. Governments must recognise that climate change is not just one of a number of issues, and we heard that from the panel earlier, that they should address through aid spending. The effectiveness of all aid spending is dependent on whether the international community rapidly and effectively combats the causes and impacts of climate change. It is why I fought against the UK government's decision to close the Department for International Development and slash its aid budget by reneging on its commitment to spend 0.7% of gross national income on official development assistance. It is why a most recent committee published just last month now recommends the introduction of a climate and development minister. And he's standing here as a fellow UK parliament, I'm frankly embarrassed given one of the wealthiest nations in the world to have cut this aid and at the same time being one of the greatest contributors globally and historically to climate change. There is no doubt that we've already seen the consequences of cuts in aid projects addressing climate change. In May this year, the UK government immediately ceased funding for a highly effective program in Indonesia, which had aimed to promote green growth and to prevent deforestation. This was despite, in fact, the COP president himself, Alex Sharma, visiting Indonesia the same month and calling for them to, and others to move forward with plans to reach net zero carbon emissions by 2050. We must walk the walk, not just talk the talk. We must be brave and act. The committee also found that far too often there was a potential for donor countries to focus on fast results rather than on tackling the root causes of social vulnerability. As a result, maladaptation it, it remains a significant risk. Furthermore, the inability to access funds quickly, and this is particularly pertinent to small nation states, and also listening to what we've heard from uh, small island states. The, we need access to funds quickly, we need to be able to scale up to successful projects and ensure they run for a sufficient amount of time. It continues to be a barrier to building trust, capacity and delivering sustainable results for those vulnerable communities requiring support. And key to tackling this is to adopt the concept of climate justice, something I've so far not heard about this morning. This will ensure that the views of the people most affected by climate change are put at the centre and that reducing poverty and addressing climate change are addressed simultaneously. However, there is a good news story to tell from these islands. The devolved Scottish Government has explicitly adopted a climate justice approach in its aid spending on climate change. And that's not recent either. That was back in 2012. It was the first government worldwide to set up a dedicated climate justice fund. This year, while others cut their aid commitments, the Scottish Government also recognised the importance of leading by example, as, a, as the world was watching us, by doubling our fund to 24 million over four years and establishing a Global South programme panel to ensure that Global South voices continue to be heard. And this week we announced at COP the Climate Justice Resilience Fund, which has broken the taboo to be able to act on loss and damage. And it will address loss and damage directly and it was humbling to hear the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, say how much he appreciated Scottish efforts in being one of the first international actors to do this. So naturally, I'm proud to say that Scotland has been a world leader in climate change, committed to the ambitious target of achieving net zero emissions by 2045. That's five years ahead of the Paris Agreement, with an ambitious interim target of 75% reduction by 2030. However, we must not rest on our laurels. As our First Minister Nicola Sturgeon said on the opening day of the conference, and I quote, the question is, is the bar of world leadership high enough? We can't rest on our laurels. We can't be complacent. We have work to do. And I share that with you and each and every one of us, because if we don't do it, who does? Now this chimed with what I heard on International Development Committee, when Diane Blacklin, who's the lead negotiator on climate change for Alliance of Small Island States said, the, the best thing that you can do is cut your emissions. As parliamentarians, we must keep this in mind and hold each of our governments to account. Tackling this global emergency is not about might and it's not just about power. It's about showing leadership 
and ambition and keeping climate action at the forefront of our domestic agendas, aid strategies and foreign policies. We owe it to those who elect and trust us to do the best for them and their communities. We owe it to the vulnerable and marginalised groups who will see deep inequality widen. And we owe it to the future generations who will look to the decisions we make today and judge what will either be our biggest success or our gravest failures. So when you return home and reflect on your time in Scotland, as we all have, we have a national flower. Think of our national flower. It's a thistle, a thistle with a delicate flowering purple crown surrounded by sharp prickles. We must grasp the thistle, be bold and courageous, absorb the short-term pain of making difficult decisions and protect our precious planet for ourselves and for future generations to come. This is what we can do and we need to do it now. Thank you. Well, many thanks to Chris Law of SNP. Um, thank you very much for attending. Thank you, children. You're allowed to go out <laughs> with your granddad. We appreciate you being here and your patience this morning. Thank you for attending. And thank you, everybody, for attending. And um, the task that you've been given, it's, it's to be holding our governments, wherever they are, to account, because not enough has been done, and more clearly must be done. And so we look forward to hearing um, what people's experience of that is. It's lunchtime now, so you are released from here for the moment. Please be back here very promptly at 2 o'clock to hear Mary Robinson. So thank you very much indeed, and thank you to my speakers this morning.